Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, coming to you from, well, you know where I am. I'm, I'm in Africa for a few months and I'm back in Accra after a whirlwind week in Addis and Cape Town. And I will have some wonderful yet again guests coming to you from those travels. But today, we're taking a little bit of a flashback to my location before landing here. And I'll get right into the bio of my guest today. She is an intelligence advisor, author, acclaimed international keynote speaker, and fellow of the Council of Competitive Intelligence Fellows. She is the founder of Mira Bure, co-founder and senior vice president of DC Analytics, and storyteller for a group of humans. She is a contributing author to A Practical Guide to Competitive Intelligence, which is available on Amazon. And she is a fierce supporter of intelligence, ethical tech, safety tech, security, privacy, and surveillance. Her eclectic 20-year career within strategic intelligence and technology has taken her from the U.S. Department of Defense to teaching business in China. She currently resides in London, where she is an intrinsic part of the tech community as a board advisor for Tech London Advocates, slash Global Tech Advocates, which includes key positions as co-lead for TLA Women in Tech and vice chair for GTA Black Women in Tech. She was recently named the most influential woman in UK tech by Computer Weekly for 2023. Suki Fuller, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Ms. Bright-eyed, (laughs) bushy-tailed, melanin, coasting, looking all flush. People, if you saw her looking all flush right now, you'd be like, jealous because it's it's shining <laughs> it's shining <laughs> thank you for having me Flo <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to host you and I think you've brought us straight to my first question which is where are you from where are you local and what is your craft that's one of those questions you know when people say where are you really from and you look at them with that side eye but then you realize I have one of those accents where you're mm-hmm, not sure mm-hmm. I have what's called a flat accent so Born in Southwest London in Balham. The hospital doesn't exist anymore. (laughs) That's how old I am. (laughs) No, actually, the hospital went out of existence the year I was born. So my mom says she thinks I blew it up. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And born, so born in the UK and uh, I would say refined and polished slightly in the US (laughs) and really turned into the diamond globally. Oh, nice. Perfectly put. Perfectly put. (laughs) Okay. And so then where are you local now? So uh, back in the birth country. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm back in the UK in Surrey. And so that's just, I'm just outside of London and loving living here in particular, just because there's more grass than concrete. Mm, Right. Exactly. And that's meaningful because your craft is... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, no not really it's not about my craft it's all about it's all about me being happy quality of life and when you live globally and I have a tendency to not live in very large cities I will live outside of the large city because I like grass I like green I like air (laughs) you know my family the U.S. family Pennsylvania hello you know the only large city is really Philadelphia. Yeah, Pittsburgh's true. okay. You know Harrisburg, eh, but you know it's all about grass. It's all about outside. So my career, what I do, what makes me money—not enough money, but you know, hey, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> That's I work in intelligence, so I'm an intelligence advisor. Okay. So, you know, you mentioned that you are from the UK, but we know that most Black people that are in the UK actually have some other roots. So tell us where you're from from in that regard. Uh, You've told us about Pennsylvania. That's one of those questions. If you were white or some other race, I'd be looking at you like, how come don't ask me that? (laughs) But that's okay. Uh Actually, no. When people ask me that, I would go, where am I from from? Well... My mom and my dad. Yeah. (laughs) I have a really mixed heritage. So you could say the majority of me is from Jamaica. 
However, with Jamaica, as we all know, we're from everywhere. Yes. Mm-hmm. So you have people that are from India, people that are Japanese, people that are, there's Germans, <laughs> there's, and these are all sort of weaved into the family history because it is so, you know, people marry in different races, but you're not seen as different race in Jamaica because you're Jamaican and everybody talks Patois. So if you talk Patois, you're a Jamaican, doesn't matter what you look like. So uh, majority of my family, I would say, just to keep the numbers whole, Jamaican, but we are pretty diverse. You know, the words that people don't like to say when they talk about Jamaicans, like coolie, so that's my grandfather's arm is very much more that sort of Southeast and Asian. And my grandmother is, you know, so it's, it's Jamaican. Nobody hates Jamaicans in the world except for other Jamaicans and other people <laughs> from different Caribbean <laughs> islands. So, so, you know, I'm working on getting a Jamaican heritage passport because pulling out the British and pulling out the American people, eh, we used to be loved now, not so much. Yeah, but, it's true. Yeah. It's but true. Jamaican passport, people either think you're related to Hussein Bolt or... or Rihanna, for some reason, even though she's not Jamaican. She's from Barbados. Right. I know, but people don't know. But they always think you're related to Hussein Bolt. So it's all good. Or Bob Marley, you know, hey, positive vibes. Sure. Why not? <laughs> so that was very interesting that you mentioned as soon as you started talking about Rihanna and Bob Marley, my my brain just went away from that comment. <laughs> 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 Which is all good. It's fine. Jamaica is one of my favorite, favorite islands. So I'm happy to say, I'm happy to I am one of those who everyone loves Jamaicans as well. <laughs> <laughs> so can I say it's the culture, it's the food. Yeah. You know, yeah. positive vibes. Yeah. Because the way we look at life is just, you know, you got to make the best of it. You got to be positive because one life, right? Right. And why not, you know, why not be positive? There's not a reason not to be. So let's get let's get into a little bit more about your so you said you're back in the UK and we obviously have this America in in within. So so tell us why the where. So how did you come to be living, working, and playing back in Surrey? And take us a little bit on the journey that took you from a young lady, a young woman in the UK to come back to the UK. Ooh, so I haven't lived in the UK since I was a little girl. So My mother and father, my father is a mechanical and computer engineer and he, he was pretty bright. And so when he was in school, he got recruited by different organizations, got a job in the Middle East. So he got a job in Saudi Arabia. So my parents, you know, young couple. So we moved to Saudi Arabia when I was little. That was an experience. Not so much that it was restrictive, because back then it wasn't quite as restrictive. But for my mother, I suspect it might have been a little bit too restrictive. Although, from the pictures, it doesn't look that way. (laughs) And that's not what I remember. But, you know, as as a little girl, you know, and I'm a Western little girl, so I'm allowed to run around in shorts or whatever. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not so restrictive. But at the time... You know, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but people may know that at that time as a young child, my mother was Rastafarian. So Mm, she had locks. Yeah. So she had locks. You know, she was very much Rastafarian, always covered herself, you know, and I was a Rastafarian little kid with my locks running around. So childhood was really a different experience for me because a lot of people sort of have their traditional viewpoint of me. They wouldn't know that as a child I was Rastafarian, apart from the fact that I didn't eat pork ever until maybe I was like 35 and I tried it and I was like, what is this? This is nasty. (laughs) (laughs) Good call. Should have just kept it that way. Yeah. So childhood, lived in the Middle East, came back to England. My parents divorced because my mother didn't like Saudi. Um, And that was the demise of my parents' relationship. My mother met my stepfather, remarried. My stepfather's in the Air Force, U.S. Air Force. And so that was the European stint, you know, Belgium, all those countries. Then the U.S. stationing at the first place I ever lived in the U.S. was Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Okay. Never heard of it. So it's in Southern California. It's about 
50 miles or so from Santa Barbara and um, about 100 and something miles from L.A. And it's right on the beach. So one of the world's most famous surfing places, Pismo Beach, is right down the street from Vandenberg Air Force Base. At the time that we lived there, it was not quite so famous. Pismo Beach, Halama Beach, those were not famous at the time. And subsequently, they've become pretty, pretty well known. Well known because of surfing culture, you would say? Because of surfing culture. Yeah, people just searching out different places for really good waves. And, you know, as Santa Barbara and all those places got more developed, people would start going there and be like, well, you know, this is a good place to surf. Right. And a good place to stay, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So, you know, done the Air Force bases, but the family is from Pennsylvania. And my side note, my grandfather, it's not side note, we're recording, so <laughs> tell the story. My grandfather's family, uh-huh. when my grandfather and some of his siblings left Jamaica, so Windrush generation, some before Windrush here in the UK, some went to the UK, some went to Canada, some went to the US. And so we have a very large contingency of great aunts and uncles already in Pennsylvania when my mother met my stepfather, you know, we already had family there. So it's like, oh, make sure you're not like a cousin. Right, right, right. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the problems with living here in Surrey, just outside of London, is I have a lot of cousins. The family is huge. My grandfather was one of 19. One of 19. And those were like, 19 half brothers and sisters those were like two people my two grandparents great grandparents had 19 kids wow so yeah so my mom lives in philadelphia now a large contingency of great aunts and uncles second third cousins living in that area so that's where my mother ended up was uh, did the stint in harrisburg and philadelphia that's where she lives i've never lived in philadelphia towards the end of high school We won't even, we don't need to talk about the high school years because there's too many. (laughs) Air Force brat. Oh, right. So the last two years of high school were at a place called REF Lake and Heath in the UK. And that's in Suffolk. So I was the stationing of my stepfather in REF Lake and Heath. And so my last two years of high school were continuous, which was great. And graduated from my high school and instead of doing the smart thing and going to university in England where it would have been zero, (laughs) I did not consider this. And I went the American route and went to Penn State. Okay. Stupid. Back to Pennsylvania. (laughs) It was stupid, but it was smart also because I think education wise, I had a much longer version of education here in the UK, school ends younger. So, you know, 16. And I think that I was not ready to be fully developed at 16. I didn't know what I, I had an idea of kind of what I wanted to do, but 16 would have been too young. I don't think I would be as successful as I am now if I had gone the British school route, Mm. because Mm -hmm. the British system is kind of a little bit classist. So they make your you make your selection of what you want to take hey, at 11 12 years old yeah and i'm like 11 12 years old are you kidding <laughs> i had a teacher my one year of secondary school here at 11 years old the teacher told me i was not good at maths mrs weber i have mentioned her many many places mrs weber because she was really heinous to me and she made me doubt everything about my ability to do anything. And when do I go? I go to Penn State and I take chemical engineering. Hello. <laughs> if I got British school system, I would not have taken AP chemistry, AP physics, AP anything in the British school system. But in the American school system, it was no, it was just kind of like, take the courses, see how your grades are, you know? <laughs> And yeah, I didn't actually have the best grades, but I had teachers that knew that I probably wasn't applying myself as much. And even recently, my AP physics teacher, 
um, Mr. Brock, who I'm friends with on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for Facebook. <laughs> yeah, he, he commented on a post recently and he said, you always were a lot smarter than you applied yourself to be. Uh, and he said, you know, we always were just like, well, you know, we'll just keep her because we know that she's a lot smarter. But he just said, you just needed sort of, he said, some people are late bloomers. And he said, you're just a late bloomer. So yeah, I, I didn't really particularly like chemical engineering though. And I didn't particularly like Penn State. Going to an Air Force high school, smaller classes. And so my graduating class was 110 people. You go to Penn State, that is not the... <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's wow. Like, it's like being put into like the middle of like... I don't know, some city in China, you know, like Beijing, you know, <laughs> and you've never been outside of some little town like Akron, Ohio, and they put you in Beijing. It, it was brutal. And I just didn't particularly care for it. Friends were great, but if you're not playing a sport at Penn State at that time, especially, you're kind of ignored, especially if you are just a student. Doesn't matter if you're a gifted student. It doesn't matter. If you are not playing a sport, you are not relevant. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean, it's a big sports school. Yeah. And so I, I transferred to the smaller Penn State campus in Erie, Pennsylvania. Yeah, so they have the Barron College for Penn State. And it was much better, smaller, made some lifetime friends there. But still, I just felt that wasn't the program for me. So I said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to drop out. And, you know, other stuff happened. It was like, I'm going to, I'm going to step away, but I'm living in Erie, Pennsylvania, where it snows. I mean, it started snowing already. <laughs> they, they, you know, it starts snowing in earliest September, uh, usually around October, November, but snow hits the ground before Thanksgiving in Erie, Pennsylvania. And so I'm living in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I'm, you know, my family is still in the UK at this time because my stepfather's still stationed there. I don't know anybody. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to stop. I had this really good, decent job. So was that your first job? No. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> first job, let's see, was REF Lake and Heath in Suffolk. I was uh, a bagger in the what we call the commissary, the grocery store. And then I worked in the shopette. And because I was British-born... I got paid in pounds and all my peers, all the other high school kids got paid in dollars because they were born in the States. So, so I was making, that's when the rate was two to one. So I was making twice as much as my friends. Wow. <laughs> it was a great, it was great. It was absolutely fabulous. That was, that was that great job before, you know, I graduated and went to Penn State. So I had like twice as much money saved up. And then let's see what else, what jobs did I do? So I worked at Chi Chi's as, as a, as a hostess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is Chi Chi's still around? <laughs> now Chi Chi's is a Spanish restaurant. I, so. I don't think so, but yeah, I remember Chi Chi's growing up. Yeah. Chi Chi's. Oh gosh. Uh, where else? I, I, you know, everybody I think works at some mall shop at least once in their life. But lucky for me, I had landed a job in a plant in a plating facility, Erie plating. And so and that's with my background in understanding chemical engineering. So I had sort of an internship sort of work program there. And I told them I'm not going back to school and continue with this. And my boss, the foreman at the time, a guy named Jim Bel Castro, who subsequently died a few years ago, absolutely wonderful. There's been a lot of champions in my life that have actually been white men. And he was really understanding. He said, you know what? It's not for anybody, but you're really talented. So we'd like to keep you working here in the lab. You know, you've trained. So we know you know how to do the job. He just said, we won't be able to promote you anymore. And you won't get as large of a raise as your peers because you're not continuing in that you're not going to finish that degree. And I was like, that's fine. I'm not working at Chi Chi's anymore. I'm not working in the mall. <laughs> I'm a ticket. <laughs> and then while I was working there, I actually discovered this program. And it was at Mercyhurst University. At the time, it was Mercyhurst College. And it is in intelligence studies. And 
I looked at this program and I was like, this is, this is me. It, it was calling my name. I was like, this is exactly who I am. It incorporated everything about what I had interest in. Love history, always loved exploring that. You know, Indiana Jones, James Bond. I always wanted to be James Bond, M, Q, everybody in James Bond. I I didn't care. I just wanted to make the gadgets, play with the gadgets, use the gadgets, tell them when they could go use the gadgets. <laughs> I wanted to be the whole cast. And Poirot. I absolutely love Agatha Christie and Poirot. My mom's book collections were just vast. So, you know, so it was always there in my mind. I should not have been reading Ian Fleming at 11. I shouldn't have been reading Agatha Christie at 11. <laughs> but hey, what could I say, <laughs> you know? And that influenced who I was and what I wanted to do. I found that program and that was everything. It, it was everything. And I went and I interviewed, you had to interview. And, you know, even after you got accepted into the university, into the college, you still had to interview in the department. And I got accepted and that was another white male champion for me. And that was uh, Bob Heibel. I have to give all these people a shout out because they they really have, really have. And to this day, I'm still, you know, still friends with him. Just saw him last year. And just, you know, just him and my mother have infatuations with each other. <laughs> you know, my parents are those people that when you, when they've been introduced to other people and they meet them, you go to see those other people and the first words out of their mouth are, oh, it's great to see you. How's your mom? It's great to see you. How's your dad? I'm going, you met my mom once. You met my dad once. You know me for like 20 years and you're asking about my mom? I understand. And then, you know, being respectful, but can I get at least a paragraph first? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how it is. And that program was great. It laid a solid foundation. So intelligence studies teaches you how to be an intelligence analyst from the theory and from the practical application. So when you walk out the door on graduation, you can go get a job with any organization or agency as an intelligence analyst because you know how to do it and you know the theory behind it. And while you're there, those four years, you do internships with government organizations, private corporations. You work on real life projects. Wow. So, yeah, it's serious implications of, you know, if you're doing this, you are doing this. Right. And you're all in. It's not a I'm taking this and then I'm moving on. It's real. And that's why they interview you in order to get and they make sure that you are serious. You know, I probably... I think there's not a dropout rate except for maybe if somebody got sick, but it just doesn't happen in that program. Sure. And so you mentioned that you felt when you first graduated that you, you needed more time. Now, are they older students or just more at a different time in their lives, like to know that this is what they wanted to do? Because I mean, when I was an undergrad, I generally knew, but I was an engineer undergrad. I apply it in life all the time, but I'm definitely not in that space now. So how would you compare yourself to your classmates? Well, I'm older because of when I entered the intelligence program, I was already one of the oldest students entering that program because I had done my stint at Penn State. So, and I'd done my stint at Penn State. I'd also done my stint of not going to school and just sort of working and trying to figure out where I was going to go. So I'm about six or seven years older than my classmates. And that makes a big difference because apparently it turns out that <laughs> I was pretty influential to a lot of them. I didn't know. I, I found this out last year. I went back to Erie and there were people there that said I had mentored them, that that I had been a mentor to them as, a, as another student. And I just, I didn't know that. I just thought I was, you know, another classmate helping somebody out because they were having problems. But, you know, I was considered sort of a, a mentor, a guide for a lot of people. And I think that actually helped. That helped me really connect with the program, connect with the other students because I was older. And a lot of those students were just traditional students. They were just going to, you know, going to college right after high school. And I had already been out in the workforce, was working, 
at any point in my life, I've never had just one thing that I'm doing. So while I'm going to school, I'm also in the Army Reserves. I'm also working a full-time job. So <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. busy. Yeah, you know, that's the nature of American colleges, right? If you're, it's like, even if you get grants and scholarships, you still need money. <laughs> you still, you still, need, you know, you still need money. So it was, you know, working, school, and the reserves. So I was involved in, the community, because I'd already had a community of friends in Erie, people that I'd worked with. Then there were people that I was in the reserves with, and then there were people I was going to school with. So I had pretty much formed a full full life. But at the same time, everybody knew that I was not from the US. I did not know that that was so apparent to other people. I did not. And I think back, and I don't think me personally, I don't think I had a British accent, but I didn't have a full American accent. And so there would be things that I would say that would sound very British. So <laughs> apparently, turns out <laughs> that uh, for the longest time in my life, I didn't say things, I didn't drag my A's. So I didn't say can't. I used to say can't. I did not, to my head, I'm like, I didn't ever say that. And friends would be like, yeah, you would always say that. And I think because back then it sounded weird to my ears to say it the other way. Yeah, it's so interesting the things that our brains do. I do not know when that when that changed, but it did change. But even people that I knew, even upon graduation from you know the Intel program, people say you still sounded so English. <laughs> I I didn't think so, you know, and then when you come back here and this is a good, you know, many years later and people go, oh, you know, you sound so American. (laughs) And and to, to my American friends, they say that are in the States, they say that I sound more British. They're all saying I sound a lot more British again. And also when I lived in China, a lot of my friends in the States said I sounded a lot more British again. Okay. Now that, I mean, that makes sense because even Chinese English is British English for the most part. So it's just really very, very, very weird. But I did not, I did not think that I sounded anything. (laughs) I thought I sounded American. I'm like, oh, you know, no, apparently not. (laughs) So now I would say that you sound both. I, I pick up both because I am listening to you talk and uh, I can see where years ago you may have definitely sounded much more British because you've, you know, taken into your time outside of the UK. And then I notice when I come back here, you know, people generally hear my English because of my intonation, but sometimes non-English speaker, well, locals, people that are more local will say, oh, are you from UK? And it's because I'm trying to mimic the way that they know English, which is British English, just to be understood. Yeah. A lot of people think that sometimes they think I'm Canadian. And when, you know, a certain former president was in office, ah. I, I claim to be Canadian those four years. <laughs> People be like, are you Canadian? I'd be like, yeah. They'd be like, oh, okay, you're cool. Here's a hard time. Let's hope, well, let's hope we don't see them again. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So I want to veer, I, you know, when you mentioned mentorship, I was getting that sense that you have very, mentorship is something that's very core to who you are. But before getting to that mentorship question, how did you get to the UK? So you went to Intel, through intelligence. <laughs> so I, I, uh, so I'll stick on track. I have, you know, I always diverge. No, no, it's perfect. I love, I love the conversation. I graduated from the Intel program. I did my little stint in national security, not naming places. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) The Department of Defense. Uh, I did some work with the Department of Defense, did some work in corporate. You sort of, the one great thing about the intelligence program is that you get to because you know the theory and the application, you can see where your skills apply the best. And for me, although national security is someplace that I think everybody aspires to go, having two passports, being a dual citizen, you know that's only a certain level you can get to because you have to give up one. And for me, I was like, 
nah, you know, that there's some things that are valuable in both, you know? So I was like, mm, but I have a business mind. I have a business sense. So I thought, well, I'm going to go. And by that time I had already met and been mentored by some of the people in the competitive intelligence world and the corporate side. And I thought, well, I'm, I, I'm good at this. I'm going to try this out. And so I did my, my business mm -hmm. world, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. automotive. The automotive was easy because I was in the engine division. And because of the background in chemical engineering, I didn't have a problem understanding the processes that go into those making the engines, dealing with oils. When I was in the Army Reserve, I started out in the Chemical Corps, the quartermaster. So I was a fuel oil lab tech. <laughs> so I understood because of the chemical engineering background, it all comes into play. And so when I go to Navistar to the engine division, I'm understanding everything that they're doing with their engines. I'm understanding the oils, the lubes, and the fuels for the engines. And that's probably where my biggest sort of breakthrough in the intelligence, competitive intelligence world happened because I was able to spot a problem that they were having with an engine they were building that somebody in my position who was just a regular intelligence analyst, maybe with a background in finance, wouldn't have found it. And so, you know, I'm going, I'm talking to the guys on the production line. They're telling me about the oils and I'm going, well, the problem is the viscosity of the oil is too thick. You know, that's why it's jamming up. And they're like, well, okay, yeah, I guess we'll try that. And I'm like, well, you know, you can try it, but there's this company over here in Brazil. They got this down. Just buy that company. <laughs> And I thought, you know, and I type up my report, you know, give it to the head of the division. And even though I'm working in the engine division, they have me sort of put into knowledge management and financial an analysis. But I'm, I'm doing the thing that I was taught to do. And I'm going to talk to everybody because the finance person needs to know everybody. So I go talk to everybody and I'm like, well, this is the problem. It's not just, you know, I'm like, this is where you're wasting money. And eventually, even though I left Navistar in 2006, I think it was, they ended up actually buying that Brazilian company. When I was leaving, that's when the conversations had started. And I think they ended up buying it in 2007 or 2008. It took a while for the sale to go through, but they did buy that Brazilian engine company. And I'm like, Shh. and then I'm thinking, why don't we get a cut of that? <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like you go to work for some company. You're Basically, like, I just yeah. helped you make a couple billion and come on, man, can I get at least 1 million out of that? But hey, you know, yeah. And then I did my stint in pharma. Pharma is a brutal trade. Uh, pharmaceutical consulting, uh, that's really cutthroat. Um, and I didn't have an MD or a PhD, but again, once again, the chemical engineering, the background in the sciences definitely helped me as an analyst to be able to see things in a more holistic manner. And yeah. And then I decided while I was working <laughs> on my MBA, I didn't decide. Um, one of my professors got ill and he was supposed to go to China and he couldn't go to China to teach um, business management. And they asked if anybody wanted to go. China, the Great Wall? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and terracotta? Are you kidding? Suki, you know, the little girl who was like wanting to be Indiana Jones, she was like, <laughs> I've got to go. <laughs> so I, I volunteered to go there and I taught at a business school for a year. So I taught grad students, professors, um, business management, computer relations, customer relations management, business ethics, which is where that started to teach them uh, professors business ethics because Lord knows. Whew. <laughs> and, um, and then after that, I was like, oh, grandparents, my two grandmothers were here in the UK and I they were getting old and I didn't really have a strong relationship with my dad's side of the family. I hadn't spoken to my dad for a long time. 
And I was, ah, maybe coming back to Europe might not be a bad idea. I was dating, I still am. Um, (laughs) It's complicated. Um, uh, A a German guy, German man. And so he was going back to Europe also. And we said, ah, you know, the seniors in our family are getting old. So came back to Europe and yeah, it was a little back and forth. Yeah, back and forth in Germany and here, but, you know, more firmly here. And then my paternal grandmother died. When did grandma die? A couple of years now. It's so weird. The pandemic threw off everything. It was before the pandemic, but it just seems like it was like just now, but because the pandemic you don't actually count. <laughs> <laughs> Including in my age. Oh, take it. <laughs> This year for my birthday, I went to the Spy Museum in New York. Oh, I love that place. Yes, yes, yes. And so when you were talking about the different the different roles and intelligence that there are, so you know, after doing all the little activities, I was a spy catcher. Ooh. Yes. So that seemed to be my my strength. I mean, I think that had I put a little bit more effort into some of the activities, I may have been a little bit higher on the strategy side, but I'll take spy catcher because I too have had the, uh, I want to be a uh, intelligence officer somehow. You know, I think we all think this adventure of traveling the world and, and busting up, you know, cartels and all of those things. And so I've always been, particularly for me on the corporate side, because I feel like corporate intelligence is what really turned the world. And so it is that kind of information that creates the competitive, like you said, competitive intelligence. That is what moves companies. That is what drives the economies of most, uh, well, the the bottom lines of most businesses and the economies of most countries. And so I'm interested to understand now. So so your why the where is family back in the UK, if, if, we're, if we're to say that, but you were, you've been particularly able to now pivot into like this bigger tech side of you. And so, so tell us more about like now being a founder and running a, an operation, you know, as a founder. I always think that's really weird because I never view myself as a founder. I think it's because I'm not entirely a tech company because I don't, I don't base it as tech first. I base my experience always is intelligence first. So everything else is sort of added on. So for me, when people say founders, it's always very much tech focused. Even when people say entrepreneurs, it's like tech entrepreneur. I'm like, well, anybody who owns a grocery store, a bodega, they're an entrepreneur. They're a founder. So for me, it's just always been, ah, I started a company. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I started a company. I co-founded a company. Yeah, that sounds really weird. No, we started a company together. It just, some of the, some of the, the phraseology just sounds a little weird to me sometimes. But yeah, the, the tech journey, so to speak, probably started before I even started the company, before I even co It probably started, I would say, The inkling was always there. I'm not a very good employee, I think. Uh, I don't know how I survived 12 years in Army Reserve because, you know, following instruction. Let me tell you, we're rough times. (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) And I'm I'm outspoken, but not in like a disrespectful way. I just, I was, I'm holding people to account. It's truth to power. And I am not going to let you slide, you know, if you outrank me. I'm not going to let you slide if you're the CEO of some major corporation and I'm your consultant. I'm going to be like, look, rule number one, you use the bathroom the same way I do. Unless you have a medical condition and you're using it a different way. But either way, every single person on this planet is born. They all go to the bathroom the same way. We all have to excrete what's in our bodies once in a while and you die. Those are three things. Everything else is just circumstance. And that's the way that I look at it. And so just founding a company, the idea is probably always there because we have a lot of people in my family that are like that. But probably, I think probably being involved with like early days of Twitter, when I was working in pharma, got to go to South by Southwest by accident. Uh, when Twitter was launching <laughs> by accident, I was visiting my brother. I was at a conference in San Antonio. I was actually at a conference in Austin. Then 
The conference ended, went to San Antonio to visit my brother and my sister-in-law at the time and hung out with them. And then for a day trip, we said, oh, let's go to Austin. My sister-in-law is really heavily pregnant. We went to Austin. It's two hours, you know, from Austin, San Antonio. And my brother wasn't with us. We went to Austin, hanging out, and she needed to sit down. So we were walking and we're like, you know, can we get a chair? And there was the Twitter launch party was going on. And we were trying to go in there and they said, no, you can't go in. And the guy, the doorman bought a chair for my sister-in-law to sit down. Someone came out and I said, what's going on in there? He said, oh, it's a private party. I said, well, how do I get in? You need a wristband. Person, two people coming out, gave me a wristband and I walked in. Twitter launch party. And so, yeah, so got my Twitter handle and I so wish I had actually signed up, like actually like physically like logged in and everything and used my first name because somebody else is Suki and she beat me by like four months. And had I signed up that, had I done it that very day, I would have gotten Suki, but you know, that's okay. But yeah. And then when I went back East coast in my pharma job, I started getting more involved with people that were using Twitter, early social media. I'd already been using blogs and whatever just for research in my intelligence, you know, work, using anything online. And so then I was like, well, this Twitter thing, hmm, let me try it out. And started getting involved with stuff like that. And back in the day when we had tweet ups and which were the early days of meetups with Twitter and hanging out with people in New York City and meeting some people who are now really big names and my friends in Twitter, Twitter sphere, you know, oh yeah, X formerly known as, yeah, we're not even gonna go there. And, <laughs> and so are you still, are you still a, a X user? Not really. I still have my handle. I do a lot of retweeting of people within sort of the women in tech, the black women in tech community, but I don't post that often. And I actually was going to exit last month. And because we have some pretty large campaigns for women in tech and black women in tech, and I wanted to amplify some people, the only reason why I'm still on there, but it's entirely different, entirely different. But that's how I sort of started my sort of tech founder journey when the tech was sort of always there. It just wasn't at the forefront. And going into my little starting my company, basically, as I said, I'm not a good employee. <laughs> I'm a good employee as in, you know, getting the work done. But when it comes to actually being the same every day, no, I get bored too easily. You know, I have a wide and varied interest, hence all the different areas of intelligence I've been in. So I want to be doing something different every day. And starting your own company is just a way of doing that. Also controlling what you do and what you don't work on. So it's easier for me, even though that check might be really good, it's like weighing up how am I going to be able to sleep when 40 years from now, I look back and go, oh, I wish I never worked on that because look at the harm it's done. You know, I'm already doing, you know, my, I don't know. <laughs> I'm already doing that. Just thinking about some of the stuff I worked on and, you know, in military and like, oh, <laughs> you know, looking back at the world and going, oh, did I pay a part in that? You know, I'm doing my reprieve right now. <laughs> Right, right. I can, I can absolutely imagine, particularly, you know, with your science and just having understood, you know, what's going on. And so I'm curious about, so starting your own business, what did it take for you? I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, just being early days in tech. So did it just kind of all fall together or how did you kind of build a network and, and start to kind of create your business development platform that helps you to actually build and um, succeed in, in operating? I think it all came together. It all kind of just fell together. So I think I, I have a vision. And while I'm working towards that goal, I realize that the goal changes. <laughs> you know, it, it always progresses. And for me, the ultimate thing is, is not so much the financial gains. 
it is the financial gains for legacy and to make sure that I'm helping my family and, dare I say, I'm not going to, Black women in particular, (laughs) to move forward, to be able to say, okay, look, she's done that, leapfrog that, I can do that. You know, it's it's not a matter of the, if you can't see it. I, I don't really believe in that phrase. You know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Because I didn't see anybody like me hmm. and I just did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, I just said, well, I'm going to do this. So, but do you think some of that, because you mentioned you, you read a lot and you have a very vivid imagination. So I often wonder about, and particularly thinking about kids now, how the systems that they're in do not necessarily cultivate the kind of imaginative thinking that I feel like so many of us and in, in former generations have had exposure to just by, I mean, you, you mentioned nature is being very important to you. So even though you say you can't see it, do you feel like somehow that vision is is just this imaginative side of you that just always is manifesting? I think um, remarkably, even though people don't believe it, when I was a child, I was really pretty introverted. My my brother, the second child younger than me, he was extremely introverted. So for the first, you know, three, four years, six six years of our lives, we were the only two children. And so when we were in a room, people didn't even know we were in the room because we were that quiet. And when I was a child, they used to call me Thesaurus Girl because I used to just, I would read anything, any, I would just grab it up and read it. And so me and my brother were always, you know, had our imaginations to play. You know, we, we just did. And I think for me, I didn't ever really, and I think this is true of a lot of kids when they're little, they don't really see race. I think they don't see race and they don't really see gender. They do and they don't. It's not until someone says, you know, he and she or girl and boy that it's so for me as a child it was just kind of like I like that character <laughs> you know <laughs> I wanted to be that character it didn't matter the character was a boy it didn't matter the character you know hell you know you read something like Charlotte's Web you know come on <laughs> bite or pig you know you didn't you weren't thinking about that you were just imagining the voices in your head and so I think that has sort of continued subconsciously for me. It's always been like, well, you know, hey, I can be that person, but not that person. I can be part of, I can take that attribute and make that mine. Okay, Global Citizens, that's going to do it for this episode, part one of my conversation with Suki Fuller. Please be sure to join us next week when we talk more about Suki's work in the UK and in tech, as well as a great conversation about what she's reading and what she's watching. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and catch us Tuesdays with new episodes at GlocalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, bye for now.